Is this, is this where I start? This is, this is your spot. Go now. Yeah. Start yeah. now, okay. The commercials are over. <laughs> so, the sound's good, everything's good. We're ready to rock and roll. We are. Are you good? <laughs> I'm, yes, I, well, since you stopped anyway. So what does it take to become a pilot? Basically what you need to do is you need to have the drive. Without the drive, you'll never make it through because it is a huge commitment of time as well as money. Now the money part, I think people overestimate how much it costs. And while the cost is not insignificant, it is not such an amount that in today's day and age, I would say the average person can afford. If you place a priority on learning how to fly, chances are you'll be able to find the money to do it. So the cost of getting a private pilot certificate, which we have to be careful about people, it's not called a license and there's people that'll come down on you if you call a license. So it is a certificate. So that is what a certificate looks like. And then on the back you have the Wright brothers and it has your signature and um, on the front it has all your endorsements and I would assume type ratings if you have a type rating, which I don't have. So in order to get that certificate, what you need to do is go sign up at a flight school. The first thing they'll do is, like I did, is they can give you an introductory flight, take you up and show you what it feels like, and you can say, hey, this is amazing, or I never ever want to do that again. Most people, if they have the idea that they want to fly, are going to be pretty okay with the unusual sensation of flying. And for those of you that haven't flown in a small plane, the best thing I can say is it feels a lot like riding in a boat. So if you've ever been out on the water and you've been floating around and you've been in waves and stuff like that, that's basically what flying feels like. The waves are just like turbulence. The only difference is you're dealing with water versus air. So they'll take you up on a discovery flight and then if you decide you want to do that, they'll sign you up for flight school. From there, you have some choices you need to make and that is what do you want to fly? Obviously, the better plane you fly, the more expensive the plane, then the more it costs per hour wet. When you rent a wet, that means it includes all the fuel. So the entire time you're up flying, all the fuel is included in your rental price. And you pay based on the hobs, which is the hour meter in the plane. So from the time you turn it on and the hob starts running, then that's when you're going to get billed for. I want to say the 172s that I was flying, I think it was about $135 an hour. And I chose to fly the 172 just because there's a little, they're a little bit wider and there's a little bit more room. They also have a little bit higher weight capacity. I was able to take my kids with me so that they could experience and get used to flying so that when I was done flying, they already had some comfort level with flying. So that was really neat to be able to do that. The 152s are a lot narrower and you're going to be basically shoulder to shoulder with your instructor. And if you're a bigger person, you're probably not going to want to cram in there like sardines with your instructor. Those are a little bit cheaper, but they're also a little less powerful. You can also rent in some places 182, which is going to be more powerful, more weight capacity and stuff like that. But as you go up in power and instrument packages and stuff like that, then the cost goes up as well. Then you have glass panels versus steam gauges. Now steam gauges are going to be around dials and those are going to be analog not digital, but if you have a glass panel, like a very common thing for a flight school, is going to be a G1000, a Garmin G1000 panel. Those panels are quite expensive, so they usually get more per hour if you're going to rent. So you really need to think about what you're going to fly, and the cheaper you're trying to get it done, then the smaller the plane with less features you're going to want to start with. So from there, I started training, and it took me probably about 20 hours to solo, which means that we went up and we did a whole bunch of practice stuff. And the first thing you're going to go do is you're going to get comfortable in the aircraft. When I went up the first time, it was kind of like being in a boat and you're worried that every time you turn and you bank just a little bit, that it's you're just going to tip over somehow and that everything's going to go awry and you're going to crash into the ground. So you have to get comfortable with how to do that stuff and how to basically do coordinated turns, which is turning using your rudder as well as your ailerons so that the plane stays coordinated and you do a lot of maneuvers. So it stalls, turns, a bunch of maneuvers like that, but then you do a ton of landings. And I remember thinking when I was getting started that, you know, I mean, how hard can landing really be? Let's be honest. I've operated anything with a joystick and I'm a pretty good equipment operator, so how, how bad is this gonna be? Well, let me tell you what, landing and doing good landings is something you will be working on for the rest of your life. There are days when I still feel like I don't have it mastered and I'll come in and we'll do a landing and I'll think to myself, well, that just was not very good. Uh, I was shooting for the thousand footers and I bounced it just a little. Jeez, that wasn't like go. a bad one, but. And then there's days when I 
feel like I'm my own hero and I just really grease it in there. Set the bar pretty high so I expect everything to be this, this smooth from here on out. So that is going to be a skill that most pilots, even after they have thousands and thousands of hours, will criticize themselves on. And they won't let you solo until they're very confident that you have, you'll be able to get the landings stuck. So after they feel like you're confident in your landings and you can go up and maneuver and everything, they'll let you solo. And basically, the first solo you're ever going to do is go do three takeoffs and three landings with your instructor, basically standing out on the ramp, watching you do these things. So there's two different ways that you can go about getting your flight training. One of them is part 61 and the other one is part 141. Part 141 applies to flight schools and is more structured. So what they do is they'll follow a syllabus, very structured syllabus that allows you to go through your course training. Now, if you're going to be doing a little bit of training with this instructor and then you're going to jump and you're going to go to another instructor, then probably part 61 may work better for you. If you're going to jump around or you're going to travel around the U.S. and use several different instructors, it's basically skills based, whereas the syllabus is going to be followed for part 141. So I did my initial private pilot certificate using part 141 and then when I went back I bought a plane and I ended up flying around a whole bunch and building a whole bunch of hours in between getting my private pilot certificate. It was better for me to use part 61 because I could log a bunch of those hours that I had used to fly cross country in my own plane without having to have an instructor because some of that is just time building. The next thing you'll do after you solo is work more on your skills, being really comfortable in those skills, make sure that you have your landings more secure and your crosswind landing procedures and things of that nature. You'll do more cross-country stuff, which means that you travel with your instructor across country so that towards the end of your training, you're actually doing your own cross-country, which is kind of the grand finale as far as finishing up your training and being ready to fly on your own is learning how to navigate and fly cross-country. If you do part 141, when I finished up at the end of part 141 training, they did kind of a pre-check ride, which was just to make sure that you knew everything and quiz you really hard, fill out, figure out if there was any holes in your training, oral examination part, plus they did the skills-based part where you go up and fly and show them. And then if there was any holes, they kind of tried to fill those in before you did your final end of course. And that's what it's called as an end of course. It's not technically a check ride when you do part 141. Um, the school that I used over in Cody was able to do all their own in-house examinations or end of course evaluations so that I didn't have to go out and find an external DPE uh, to do my examination, which made it really handy. I guess there's some people that talk about waiting for a month to be able to get in with a DPE to do their check ride. So that part of doing the 141 training was very nice. The fact that this is a flight school rather than just some individual CFI that that did the training. If you do part 161, you're going to have to find a DPE uh, in your local area that can come up and evaluate you at the very end. And hopefully your flight instructor would be running you through your paces to make sure you're hundred percent ready before you spend that money. Because once you spend the money to do that, it's gone. The final thing before you can actually sit for that final examination, either an end of course or a check ride is going to be, you're going to have to take a written portion. To be able to take the written portion, you have to go through a ground school. It's called a ground school. And that's like the book portion where they actually teach you about weather and aeronautical and navigation and all the different instruments inside your airplane and how they work and a little bit about how the plane engine works. And so they basically cover the overview of flying start to finish. At the end of that, you've got to take a written examination. Uh, you'll have to go to a testing center or, in my case, the facility that I used to the flight training school that I used. So before you can take your trek ride, you'll need to go through a ground school. After you're done with the ground school, you'll get a certificate that says they've passed the ground school and now they're eligible to take the written test. And once you pass the written test, you've gone through all your training, you've passed your check ride, that's when you'll be issued your certificate. So it's, it's quite a process. So the next thing everybody asks me is how long is that going to take? And really the answer is going to be dependent upon you. If you focus and you buckle down and you really focus on what you're doing and the more you fly and the more you stay on top of it, the faster it'll go. I did mine in about four months. April 17th was maybe the first flight that I took, introductory flight, and I had my pilot certificate by my birthday. Oh, maybe August 9th or 10th uh, that same year. So about four months it took me to get all the way through everything, but I stayed right on top of it. It was 
plenty of time spent in the evenings going through my online ground school. Kind of back to that, you do have an option of doing on self-study ground school. You can actually enroll in a ground school. The flight training center or the flight school that I went through actually works with our local community college. So they put on some ground schools a couple times a year, but that just wasn't gonna work with my schedule, so self-study was much better for my particular application. I would say that on average, you can get your private pilot certificate in maybe as little as 40 hours, but chances are you're gonna have somewhere between 50 and 70 hours um, before you're finally done. And if you drag it out and you only fly one time a week and it takes you longer to learn the skills because you're, you lose so much in between each flight, then you could have closer to 100 hours and there's probably people that have got way more than that. I know students that uh, are kind of perpetual students and they'll get done with all their flying and still not have their written done. So they're still just flying and they always have to be with an instructor. So. That's really upon you and how fast you want to work through it. If you're really focused and you buckle down and you've got the money ready to go, then you'll whip right through it. And I would definitely recommend flying a minimum of two times a week, preferably three or four. The more you can do it every day, the faster it's going to go and the more results you're going to see. But if you're going to do that, you need to make sure that you're doing the studying at night to make sure you get through it as fast as possible as well. And you'll be building on the skills that you're learning in the classroom or online versus what you're learning in the airplane. So the total cost for something like this to get a private pilot license is, I would say on the low side is going to be about $8,000 if you chose the cheapest plane and you ran through it as fast as you possibly could. Or more likely you're going to be somewhere up around the $12,000 range, depending on how many hours it takes you to get secure in all of your skills and abilities. And that's what I did. So I spent probably about twelve to thirteen thousand dollars flying in the 172. So one of the first things, one of the biggest drivers for me to get my private pilot's license was the fact that I service several gate operators around the state of Wyoming. So gate operators think automatic entryway gates and stuff like that. We do a lot of work over in Jackson Hole. And if you want to know more about that and what we do there, you can check out our channel at SWI Fence on YouTube where I talk a little bit more about some of the things that we do for our company. The first thing after private pilot certificate was to get a high performance and complex endorsement. So right out of the gate, most typically you can't fly high performance aircraft, which is anything over 200 horsepower. And you can't fly a complex aircraft, which is something with a constant speed prop, flaps and retractable landing gear. So because I knew I was gonna enter airplane ownership, I knew that getting a complex endorsement was going to be important. So I rented the 182, which I think rented for about 185 an hour wet versus the 135. So there was a pretty significant cost difference. After flying the 172, it only took about 10, maybe 12 hours, flight hours for me to get really secure in uh, the different systems and, and checklists that are associated with a complex aircraft. Learning the constant speed prop, the really basic engine analyzer so I could tell whether what my AGTs and CHTs were, which are exhaust gas temperature and cylinder head temperature. And so they taught me how to properly lean the mixture for that. Maybe a little bit faster at doing that because there was a couple times we took a trip Uh, I had my flight instructor go with me when I was still in private pilot training and we went down to Salt Lake and did a flight over there. And one of the reasons that I did that is because living where I do, I knew that learning to get comfortable in the mountains and flying over the mountains was going to be really important. So I figured what better way to do that than make sure that I have a flight instructor with me to help me navigate those new challenges. And I remember the first time we did our first cross country, he said, where do you want to go? And I picked something that was up over a mountain just because you've got to get comfortable with that. And I know there's several private pilots that I've talked to that are out in the flatlands and the mountains still make them very, very nervous. So if you're going to be doing that type of flying and you think you're going to be going these places, make sure that you get lots and lots of experience with that right away. So after I finished up with my complex endorsement, which is the first endorsement on my license, I went straight into IFR training. I got my certificate in August, received my endorsement very shortly after, maybe the next week or something like that for for complex and high performance. And then kind of just flew around and got comfortable flying around for a while. And I was really busy with work, so I didn't start into training. So about November, I started with the IFR training, which is instrument flight rules, visual flight rules and instrument flight rules, VFR versus IFR. Now, private pilot certificates are VFR only, which means you have to stay out of the clouds and they have certain cloud clearances that you have to abide by. When you step up into IFR, that's when you can fly in the clouds and you receive special 
clearances from ATC that allow you to do that. And that means that they're helping you watch for other traffic because obviously if you're inside of a cloud, you can't see where the other traffic is around you. i had read a lot of books about how people crash aircraft and I've watched a lot of YouTube videos on how people crash aircraft. And one of the biggest killers was visual flight rules into IMC, which is instrument meteorological conditions. So people that don't have their instrument rating go flying into the clouds, get disoriented, and crash your plane into the ground. A lot of people think, well, you know, that's pretty easy. Just stay on your gauges, but you're just gonna have to trust me when I say it's not as easy as you think it is. When your body's screaming at you that you're doing something and it's lying to you, it's really hard to overcome those urges not to do what your body is telling you to do. So if your body's telling you and you're, you're in a bank, you're gonna try and turn to the right to correct that bank but if your body's lying to you and you're actually straight and level and then you bank, you're just going to spiral into the ground. And so that's what they call the death spiral. Um, typically, it's you, your body um, thinks you're turning to the right and so you actually end up turning left and it's you do a left-hand spiral right into the ground. Somewhere there's probably a book. The Killing Zone by Paul A. Craig was what convinced me to continue my training. The more training you receive and the more you continue with your flight training, the safer you'll become and the less chance that you're going to pile your plane up into the ground. And I got into flying. I don't know what your purpose for getting into flying is, but mine was to have fun, do what I need to do, save time. It wasn't necessarily to go out there and find out how fun it would be to pile it up into the ground. Because for me, that's not fun at all. Private pilot took me about four months, instrument took me another four months, and the costs were very similar. I was able to do some of the training in a simulator, so we had really bad weather days. That training could actually be done in a simulator, which I really hated. I don't like flying simulators near as much as I like flying the real plane. And I think the big reason for me is, is that I didn't get the sensation. Sure, I was in the clouds and I was moving the yoke and manipulating the rudder and doing those different things, but it just, there was none of that. You couldn't feel anything in the seat of your pants, so. That seat of your pants flying was non-existent. But it did really make you pay attention to what you were doing because because you couldn't feel, it was really easy to start over banking and not realizing it kind of like you could in the clouds. The other way that people get into that situation is because the workload gets a lot higher. So when you're trying to program approaches and you're over here and you look down and you're looking at your iPad or something in your lap or you look down for a pen or you're trying to program an approach into your GPS or even program a new flight plan that uh, air traffic controls have given you, it can get really, really busy. And if you're not paying attention, you can be doing that turn the whole time, not realizing it, and then look up. And by the time you look up, it's you're struggling to try and understand what the gauges in front of you are telling you. You can see a bank and not really um, kind of into that brain lock where your your brain says, well, I don't know how to correct this because you're under so much stress at that point in time. I remember when I was doing the aerobatics training here not too long ago, we we're trying to do rolls and he said, you know, when you get when you get there, do you have enough brain power to be able to figure out what point you're trying to turn around? And that's really, that's really true and that can start an instrument training. So finished up the instrument training in March and then bought a plane in April. I think probably right out about a year from my first flight to owning a plane. Got a high performance complex plane, Gus, the same one that you see on the channel today. Then started getting into commercial. Now for commercial I ended up doing part 61 because with my own plane I was able to fly around and do a lot of flying on my own without having to have an instructor. And it was things like doing long cross countries all the way to Florida that helped me build hours and time. So a lot of what I did with my instructor was just hammering out some of the new maneuvers. I asked them kind of what the difference was between all the training and they said, you know, private just teaches you how to fly. Instrument makes you a better pilot and then commercial makes you a smoother pilot. So, and that's one of the things I had to overcome when I went to the Patty Wagstaff school is, is I was still trying to fly commercially and make everything nice and smooth. And they're like, no, just mash it. And so that was, it was a real struggle for me to, to overcome those tendencies because I was just trying to, you know, make nice smooth banks and, you know, like I was carrying a, a plane load of people that were going to puke at every turn. So I started that training right away, but then got busy again with the summer and just kind of, I was done probably about July with all of the hours and everything I needed and just got so busy that I couldn't get in there. So I ended up waiting until January of this last year before I finally finished up my commercial training. I was almost there and I could have tested in July, but then got busy and waited another six months to finally finish that up. 
And that's when we put out the video here recently at the beginning of the year, uh, finishing up that commercial training. Did you pass? Yeah, so the DPE said that I passed. So I met the standards. Was it hard? Yeah, it was, it was tough. And that was actually a check ride with an examiner. But the examiner, uh, coincidentally, works for the Choice Aviation who did all my flight training. And if you're in the Wyoming area or if you're in the Northern Bighorn area, these guys are great and they do a ton of training. I can't recommend them highly enough. They, they've really been good at helping me and working through some of the issues. So the cost for doing the instrument training was very similar to the cost for doing private. I did have to train in the 172 and then you can cheapen that up because the simulator costs less than the real plane because there's no fuel in it. So. Um, if you can do some of your time in a simulator and cheapen that up, but I would probably plan on again spending about $12,000 to get your instrument rating on average. Um, some places may do it a little bit cheaper than that and some may be a little bit more expensive depending on what kind of gear you're flying. The longer it takes you to pick it up, the more it's going to cost and that's not really on the school. That's more about how long you know, or how well you learn. You're going to have to go through a ground school. You're going to have to do a written test. Then after the written test, I do all the flight training. Then at the end of the course, I do a end of course review. And then after the end of course review comes back satisfactorily, then we do an end of course, which is where I am issued a uh, instrument rating provided I've done everything to their satisfaction. As far as commercial is concerned, you can do commercial part 61 or part 141. I did mine part 61. Part 61 was commercial training and I just built time, did not follow exactly a syllabus. I was doing all my cross country on my own and then filling in the holes that I had in my training with a flight instructor, the same flight instructor I used for everything else. So we did things like figure eights and chandelles and steep turns, different things like that. So that was all about making me a smoother pilot and really valued that training. By the time I got done with all of my training to the point that I'm at now, I think I have 350 hours. That's more than most people would have if they just went and did all their training. So where I'm at now and where I'm going to go. Uh, I have a lot of people ask me if I'm going to start flying for a living and that's never been my goal from day one. I don't have any desire to go fly for the airlines or even fly charter for that matter. My goal in learning how to fly was basically self-serving. I wanted to advance my company and just be able to get where I want to go faster. And I do like to have good adventures. So yeah found myself traveling more and more across the United States, going to different functions and needing to be in different states. Having a certificate has really helped that so that I can do that more freely. It does not always mean that it's faster for me. It doesn't mean that it's cheaper, but what it means is, is that I have the flexibility to get where I want to be without any issues. I don't have to pre-schedule all of my flights with an airline. I do find that on certain times I need to be extremely flexible and I might not be able to leave on the day that I was initially planning. I might have to wait three or four or five days just to get enough good weather to get back home. So if you're getting into flying thinking that you can fly every day, that's not gonna be the case at all. So we're ready to leave Sullivan, Indiana, but we have a little problem. And it's called, look at all this fog. Not something I'm ready to take off in zero zero. We don't have quite zero zero, but uh, just not something we're willing to do with the skill set that I have today. So this is one of those times when we wait. You have to have an extremely capable aircraft and not only that, but you have to be capable and proficient in your skills to be able to pull that off. So it's kind of a, a, a balance. When I took Gus down to Florida for an avionics upgrade, it took me five days to get out of PAL. And I barely had enough weather window to get from PAL down south before the weather really locked in. And even down in Texas, they were having some pretty cold and chilly weather. So my plane is not known ice capable or it's not Ficky capable. I can't fly in the ice, but I don't have oxygen. That's something that you don't think about, but needing to have oxygen up high. Uh, I've since got an oxygen tank and now I can fly higher if I wanted to, but my plane's not turbo. So it really starts losing performance the higher we go. So there are certain limitations that just tell you you can't do all the things that you think you can do just because you have a plane. Another common misconception of people with planes is, well, it's four seats, you can just fill it up. That's not at all. If you're thinking that just because you have a four seat plane, you can fill it all the way up and you can put four grown adults in there and fly it full of fuel, that is absolutely not the way it works. Everything is weight based. And so that's why sometimes they talk about weight and balance and they may have to move around the aircraft. And pilots will say something like we're calculating weight and balance. When you get on the commercial flights, that's what they're doing is they're making sure that 
the they can generate enough lift to take off and how much runway they're going to take and things of that nature. The big one I think people don't realize is you can't fly in the clouds. I did. I was up there doing uh, my introductory flight, and he says, oh, we well, need to turn a little bit to the right because we're going to go into those clouds. And I remember thinking, like, what's the problem? I kind of want to fly around in the clouds. So back on that, another story, the first time I ever flew in the clouds, because I did all my training around here, we use what's called foggles for instrument training. And that's where you basically put on a view-limiting device, and you fly around not being able to see much of anything, but you still have you know, a little bit of vision out of your periphery or through the bottom of the glasses. The first time I ever really flew in the clouds, I was not with an instructor. I was on a long cross country just outside of Nashville, Tennessee, when I got into the clouds. I remember that feeling of total inadequacy. Just got done, so I was proficient, knew how to do all my approaches. It wasn't a problem with that. I just, it was so unlike anything I had experienced, I really felt ill-prepared. So if you're going to do stuff like that, what I would encourage you to do is take an instructor or go somewhere before you fly in the clouds and fly with an instructor somewhere where you can get into the clouds more often. I knew I was going to fly in the mountains, so I went up practice in the mountains, but I didn't really think about how I could get more time in the clouds. And if I was going to do it all over again, I would go do that. And I still have it on my list of things to do is, is go to Florida and maybe this summer. And if we can get a whole bunch of low overcast days, um, go fly with an instructor and get really proficient at that so that I feel confident and secure in that in that skill. One thing I forgot to talk about is you will need a medical. If you have medical issues, that can come up. And unfortunately, people that were put on Ritalin and some of those other things, antidepressants, you may struggle to get a medical. So there's three types of medical certificate, class one, two, and three. I just have a class three right now. I think I'm gonna get a class two just because I have my commercial certificate. And class one would be if you're in the airline. So look those up. Those are the three different types of certificates. If you're just gonna be a private pilot and fly yourself around, a class three is all you're gonna need. So that's everything I can think about, all the questions I've been asked over the, t over the years. Oh, geez, another thing we gotta cover really quickly. If you know a pilot, somebody that has their private pilot, they can't pack you around for money. So just know that. They can't take you around. It doesn't matter how much money you offer them, they can't charge you money. You have to have certain licenses and operate under certain rules. So if you think they can haul you somewhere and you'll be able to pay them or it might be cheaper than flying the airlines, it is not. Don't hit your pilot friends up and tell them you'll pay them to fly you wherever you need to go or think that it's cheaper than flying commercial because it is neither. Um, it's, if they can do it, it won't be cheaper and you'll just be irritating them. So have some respect for your pilot friends and don't ask them to fly you all over the place because it's not quite that simple. That's the only thing I can add to that. So hopefully we've eliminated some of the myths and talked about some of the ways that you can become a pilot and what's involved in becoming a pilot. And I encourage you, if you're at all thinking about this, just go get started. Go take that test flight. I think it's $75 is what they charged at my local airport. And the best way to find out where to go do those things is go to your local airport. They know who to talk to and can get you signed up with somebody. Find an instructor that is a good teacher, is qualified, and will put you through your paces. This is one of those places where you don't want the you don't want somebody to just check boxes. You actually want somebody to be hard on you because it's going to benefit you in the long run. So until next time, fly safe, fly high, and not that kind of high. What you see behind me and around me is new. It's a studio that we built in my basement. So I am actually broadcasting from an underground bunker in my basement, which is kind of cool. Um, it's hard to get the signal out. So hopefully this is reaching you just fine. But